Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Dawes. I'm the Assistant Dean for STEM at uh, Springfield Technical Community College. I just wanted to start off today by first and foremost welcoming everyone, uh, especially our, our great partners from UMass Amherst, and congratulations on your uh, recent NCAA hockey win as a hockey fan. Just thought I'd throw that one in there, too. Um, but most importantly, all of our students that participated and created such great and, and wonderful presentations and projects uh, for our event today. I think it's one of the most uh, important things with, with an event like this to remember um, how important our not only our individual accomplishments, but our accomplishments as a group uh, in trying to create a better, more sustainable world around us um, is really the only way we'll be able to do that in the future. And, and all of you are helping to take some of those initial steps in some of the work you've been doing today. So uh, thank you so much for that. I also want to thank uh, our senator, uh, who we'll be hearing from in a minute, as well as the mayor of Springfield, we'll be hearing from in a minute uh, for lending their voices to this event today uh, and lending support for some of the great and, and wonderful work that you all are doing as students, that our fellow faculty members are, are doing, uh, and that all of us are doing together as a group. So again, I just want to extend my thanks and my warmest welcomes to everyone. Um, and remind everyone uh, what a great job they did and how proud the entire STEM division, STEM Dean's Office, and the administration at STCC are of all of our students uh, who make us look so good as an institution and are one of the reasons why STCC uh, has been ranked one of the, the fourth best community colleges recently because not not because of, of me and administration, but it's because of you, our students, who make us such a wonderful institution. Uh, let me continue and uh... I echo everything that Pat said, uh, a hearty welcome and thank you for being here. Um, when I see uh, young students, I only see future leaders. You are the leaders, you are the policy makers. So I'm like super thrilled that you are here. Again, my thank you list is also humongous. I am like so grateful to our speakers today, Michael Rollins, Ellen, uh, Susanna and uh, June from uh, UMass and uh, University of Victoria, they are passionate to share their stories. Uh, a huge shout out to all our Indian participants today from Stella Mary's College, Government Arts College, the Biotech Group from Nagpur, my mom who is watching, my family who is watching. See, it connected us. Uh, I never connect like this. So even though we are in stressful times, we are together because we love Earth so much. Um, I want to thank the superintendent of schools, Daniel Warwick and Ron St. Armand, who's right here. Um, you know, we won't be meeting without those uh, two important support figures and our president from STIC, uh, President Cook, and all the administrators very quick story as to why this happened, uh, why we are having this event. So several years ago, maybe eight years ago, we were visiting uh, Mexico. Uh, there is a, a, a program here called um, International Training and Development. It is run by uh, Mark Proti. So he had invited us to go to Mexico to see the environmental challenges they were having. So it's like 11 o'clock at night, it's in a remote village in Mexico. Just picture this in your mind. It's dark. All the farmers, families, they've worked hard and they've gone home. But at 11.30 at night, the, the leaders of that little community, they all come together under this banyan tree, 11.30 at night. And everybody's huddled together, sipping like spicy hot chocolate. And they were passionately talking about something in Spanish. And the, the, the conversation got heated up and like very soon one of the old uh, farmers started to cry. And then I asked why, what's happening? And they said, everybody is talking about how the younger generation is leaving the village. And this old man is not able to sustain his farm anymore. No one spoke about climate change. No one spoke about climate action or STEM innovation, none of that. It was that feeling of hopelessness that I saw. 
And it, that was one of the reasons that like I thought like I should come back here and then create awareness to our future generations, a, a message of hope, because that's the most powerful message. So my, my ultimate goal for our time together is that you are a champion of change in your everyday life, doing little things that we can, little things, and then collectively, it will be a huge uh, result. So I hope you enjoy our time together, learn a lot, put in your attendance in the chat group. You know, let's be very interactive. Um, all the best. Thank you. Well, uh, we will move on into our keynote. We have two keynote speakers. Uh, uh, our first is uh, the Senator uh, from Massachusetts. I'm going to play a video. Uh, Hello, Springfield Technical Community College. I am Senator Ed Markey, and I wanna thank you for having me today to celebrate the 51st Earth Day. As we celebrate this year, let's talk about what it will take to preserve a livable climate and planet for all of the Earth days to come. A livable climate that allows us not just to survive, but to thrive. In the past year, a year with crises on many fronts, Americans faced devastating hurricanes, unprecedented wildfires, and freezing temperatures that caused tragic loss of life and more than $95 billion in damage. Last year also tied the 2016 record for the hottest year ever, capping what was the planet's hottest decade ever. And of course, the burden of this excess heat fell disproportionately on disadvantaged communities and people of color. As we experience the consequences of the climate crisis more often, and as we feel its threats more severely, Americans are putting forward a clear mandate to combat our planet's greatest threat. The Green New Deal resolution that Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I introduced in 2019 has helped launch a revolution that put in motion a massive 10 year mobilization to create clean energy jobs, millions of them, union jobs, and transform our climate our economy and our democracy. From the air we breathe, to the jobs that employ us, to the neighborhoods that we live in, to the economy we operate within, climate change defines our existence. And as we recover from this devastating pandemic, we know that we cannot build back better without building back greener. We need to invest in bold, clean energy technologies and green infrastructure projects to create millions of good paying union jobs and get our economy back on track. We know that the Green New Deal can be our blueprint for recovery. It would be millions of jobs in clean energy, overhauling our transportation systems uh, to make them climate smart, upgrading buildings to be energy efficient, uh, helping build a smart grid, restoring watersheds, uh, refuges, and natural ecosystems. You are the great minds behind this technological revolution that has already played an enormous role in the growth of our clean energy economy. And in the past decade, innovation in clean energy sector has led to a rapid expansion of solar and wind and hydropower and other renewable energy sources, drastically changing the way we power this country. In 2010, renewable energy was the smallest source of power generation in the United States and coal was the largest. But by 2020, just 10 years later, renewable energy generation has doubled and coal became the smallest source of power generation in the country. Thanks to technological innovation, clean energy is not just the right choice for the environment, but also for our economic success. Renewables, uh, energy technologies that have yet to be uh, uh, invented, they're gonna become cost competitive technologies uh, for new installations. And globally, investment in new renewable energy infrastructure has been double that of new energy investment in fossil fuels and nuclear. And it's not just in the power sector. In 2008, there were only 2,580 electric vehicles on the road in the United States just 10 years ago. Now there are more than a million and a half. By building on these technological innovations, we will work towards a better future for all Americans. This mobilization to combat the an uh, incredible climate crisis we're facing will also be an opportunity to repair the historic oppression 
of frontline and vulnerable communities, which have borne the worst burdens of pollution from our fossil fuel economy. Through our efforts to address the climate crisis, we can lift up all workers and all communities. This Earth Day, I re reiterate my call for bold and ambitious action to combat the climate crisis. Tackling the climate crisis will not be easy, but we can do it with a green new deal. So thank you all for everything that you are doing. I'm looking forward to seeing all the great things that Springfield Technical Community College and the STEM Starter Academy will do to help solve the climate crisis and save our planet for future generations. You are the green generation. Thank you for all of your leaderships. Thank you to Springfield Technical Community College. Thank you to the STEM Starter Academy for all that you are doing and that you will do. Thank you. All right, our uh, next keynote is uh, Mayor Sarno um, from the city of uh, Springfield. To my Johnny Appleseed, Dave Blowers, and to the students at Springfield Technical Community College and to the speakers on this event, Sustainathon, say that 10 times fast. As we continue to move forward and going green, Dave has played a pivotal role uh, with re Green Springfield on our tree canopy. And Pat Sullivan, my Director of Facilities and Arts Management, has really been my point person as the City of Springfield continues to go green. And for an urban center, uh, we're sort of leading the charge on that. As you come together today, it is so important that we continue to respect our environment. Uh, having a good environment is not only good for uh, public health and the environment, but it's also good for the bottom line of the budget whether it's a business budget, a governmental budget, or a home budget. So Dave, to you and your crew, thank you very much for what you continue to do. And I wish each and every one of you and your families a good health as we move and we will defeat this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. I can't wait until we have the, the day that the air hugs are gone and we can come together as one, maybe under a nice tree Canopy right here in the city of Springfield. God bless. Mayor Dominic Sarno. All right. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Rollins. Uh, Dr. Ray Rollins is a associate director of the Climate Systems Research at UMass. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Timothy. <clears throat> I'd like to speak with you uh, briefly this morning about um, understanding the causes and consequences of climate change. In order to be effective in climate action, it's really important to understand the basics of our climate system and how the system is changing. So I'd like to step through a few slides here with you and we'll have a little poll that I'll uh, ask you to engage in uh, in a few moments. So as Senator Markey mentioned, 2020 was tied for the hottest year on record. And if we look at data from all weather stations across the globe and average them across the globe, we can clearly see that the earth is warming. That's without question. 97% of climate scientists agree that the climate is warming. You can see here the early part of the century, fairly flat, there was uh, some cooling mid-century, but since around 1960, global average temperatures, regardless of what data set we use, many data sets all agree the earth is warming. That's without question. The data show that. What's causing that? Well, human activities have resulted in an approximately 45 to 50% increase in greenhouse gases. The chart on the bottom left here shows the past five to six years of data of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as measured in Mauna Loa and Hawaii. And you can see each year, you see the red line wiggling up and down. Well, that's basically the earth breathing. During the springtime and summer, the earth absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, plants and trees grow. You'll see all the vegetation growing around here. And then in the fall and the winter, that carbon decays and goes back up to the atmosphere. So you can see that wiggle up and down, but nonetheless, 
the concentrations are increasing. You can see that on the panel on the right, CO2 measured since 1960, you see an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Okay? So that's what's driving our warming. And that's from measured data from Hawaii that basically captures the global average, if you will, because it's in the middle of the ocean, away from industrial sources. If we go back over the past 2000 years, shown on the bottom left, temperatures were fairly stable. Same thing with greenhouse gases in the panel on the right-hand side. Atmospheric CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide measured in ice cores was fairly stable. Atmospheric CO2 was around 280 parts per million. And then you could see in the past 100 years or so, a rapid increase in the carbon dioxide as measured in these ice cores. Okay, So it seems that you would see some agreement between the atmospheric CO2 concentrations and the temperatures in the bottom left. They seem to agree. Let's pause here and we'll pop up a, a poll and I'll have you uh, engage in a poll and answer uh, a question here about what drove atmospheric CO2. And I don't believe, do I need to stop share, Timothy? Uh, let me try, you know, if it doesn't show up, you know, you can stop the sharing. Let me try it, okay? I see the poll. Okay, go ahead. Okay, climate changes over the past million years have been influenced primarily by. And after about another, we'll give you folks another 30 seconds and Timothy will report back uh, the results for us. Okay, so what do we think, folks? What do we have? All right. Um, so, eighty-one percent of you said humans burning fossil fuels. Ten percent changes in Earth's orbit around the sun. Three percent of you said shifting configurations of con uh, continents, and six percent large volcanic eruptions. Okay, so over the past million years, humans have only been influencing the climate for about the last 100 to 150 years since we've been burning fossil fuels, okay? So over the past million years, if we go to the next slide here, you can see carbon dioxide in the blue curve and Antarctic temperatures. This is measured from ice, cores data, ice core data in Antarctica. So we can go back and look at the bubbles in the ice cores and see what the temperatures and the concentrations of carbon dioxide were. And over the past million years, these wiggles up and down, the warming and the cooling are due to the changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. I won't go into what these different orbitals uh, mean, but you can look up Milankovitch cycles and you can understand that the slow changes in the Earth's orbit caused us to warm and cool over the past million years, okay? Humans have been having an influence over the past 100 to 200 years since we've been burning fossil fuels since the industrial revolution, okay? So as the climate warms, we have an increase in the mean temperature. But when we have an increase in the mean, you're also going to see more hotter days, the extremes. And we know the climate's warming because if we look at the number of record high temperatures set to the record lows, there are more record highs being set than record low temperatures. So the climate is not stationary. As we warm up the average temperatures, we're going to, we, we are seeing and we are going to see more of the warm extremes, the tail of the distribution, if you will. Much of the energy from the greenhouse gases is going into the warming the oceans. Okay, the oceans are absorbing a lot of heat and periodically that heat comes out. For example, when we have an El Nino, we'll have a very warm year when there's an El Nino. That's the ocean basically 
sending some of that heat back up to the atmosphere to warm the atmosphere. But much of the warming that we're seeing, much of the increasing forcing from the greenhouse gases is going into warming the ocean, particularly the upper ocean. That's absorbing a tremendous amount of energy, okay? And we can see that in the data. Ocean waters have warmed by about one to three degrees Fahrenheit over the past century. And this is leading to more hurricanes, more intense hurricanes. The atmosphere can hold approximately 7% more, 4% more water vapor for every one degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. That's why we're seeing more extreme precipitation events. A few years back, Hartford, Connecticut had um, the most number 22 days with one inch of precipitation and above. Okay, so hurricanes are intense, intensifying more rapidly. And this is because the atmosphere is more energetic. It can hold more energy, more moisture. So 2020, the past year, we saw a record Atlantic hurricane season, a record number of storms. 10 experienced rapid intensification with maximum sustained wind increases by at least 35 miles per hour in 24 hours. 2020 was just an incredible year for hurricanes in the Atlantic basin. And this is dr being driven by our more energetic atmosphere, more energy in the atmosphere is warmer. It can fuel these storms and make, an, and make them intensify more rapidly. Another manifestation of climate change is we're seeing in the decrease in Arctic sea ice extent. So October 2020 was the lowest in the satellite record for October's going back to the early 1980s when we, satellites first started measuring sea ice extent. You can see the map on the right. The pink line shows the historical extent for October 2020 the median for the 1981 to 2010 period. And you can see in white, that was last October. So the Arctic Ocean is losing sea ice. And that loss of sea ice is helping to warm the ocean even more because the sea ice reflects away sunlight, like a bright surface, like the sun, uh, snow makes your eyes. It's hard to see when you're, you have to wear sunglasses in the snow. That's albedo. That's the sunlight reflecting off the snow. So as we lose sea ice, we tend to warm the ocean even more. And that makes more sea ice loss. This loss of ice and snow is also affecting the Arctic in very profound ways. So you may have heard of Arctic amplification. As the Arctic areas that are dominated by snow and ice lose snow and ice, that's revealing more darker surfaces. And so that's, that's at a lower albedo. So that darker surface then absorbs more energy which melts more snow and ice, and that's a vicious cycle. So the Arctic is warming about three times as much as the global average. Tropical oceans are warming the least. But this is Arctic amplification. The Arctic is projected to warm much more going forward even uh, relative to the global average or what we're seeing here in the mid-latitudes. We're seeing also warming expressed locally. Now here in Massachusetts, some of you are located in Western Massachusetts. You can see here winters, winter average temperature. If you look at 2015, 2016, shown there in the bottom left, winter average temperature was just above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now think about that for a moment. Think about our winter averaging just above freezing. Okay, winters we think about cold. Well, what about the implications when you have warming, when you have warming causing our winters to then be averaged above the freezing mark? Right? That's going to affect things like ticks and mosquitoes, things, pathogens that tend to die off when we have freezing temperatures. We're likely to see more, more ticks and more mosquitoes as we lose the freezing days in our winter. Okay? So we're seeing this, this manifestation of our increasing greenhouse gases and our, and our burning of fossil fuels manifested in our temperatures, even locally, and particularly in winter. One way to look at our changing climate is to think about, well, what's the climate like in other areas of the US? So here in the east coast of the US, we can think about Vermont's temperatures. And in the future, Vermont may feel more like somewhere like the current climate of West Virginia by mid-century. 
And under the higher emission scenario, more emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, by 2070 to 2090, Vermont could feel more like Northern Alabama, okay? So this is one way we can convey how things will feel if we do not address this in a, in a sustained way and reduce our emissions of fossil fuels, like Senator Markey said, by using more renewable energy, which we're starting to bring on board, okay? So 10 indicators of a warming world, you'll have this, um, we have this recording, we have increasing air temperatures, more water vapor in the atmosphere, the oceans are warming, sea ice is declining, sea level is rising, okay? Glaciers and ice sheets and snow cover is declining. We're seeing increasing temperatures on land. Many, many different pieces of evidence suggest that we're having a, we're seeing a warming of our world. However, there's some reason for optimism. U.S. emissions decreased in 2020. Now, this was a result of the pande global pandemic. There was less transportation, less people flying around, less people driving. But U.S. greenhouse gas emissions have been trending down over the past 12 years. There are more use of gas, less coal, like Senator Markey said. Coal is very, very dirty. It's, it has a lot of um, burning a unit of coal increases our greenhouse gases in the atmosphere much more. We're seeing more renewable energy come on board and also greater efficiency. So there are reasons to be optimistic with this downward trend in U.S. greenhouse gas emissions that are likely to continue um, in the future. So we're optimistic here. There are some wind turbines coming on board that can power a home with just seven seconds of the turbine spinning. Okay, so offshore wind is going to be a big player in our renewable energy uses moving forward. This is really, really tremendous opportunities for employment and for bringing down our greenhouse gas emissions. And with that, I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you for all your engagement. And um, let's celebrate Earth Day by doing our part to um, help uh, solve the climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, there are a couple of questions I want to draw your attention to on the chat box. So I, I'm going to read uh, two of them just for want of uh, time. So why is New England more susceptible to climate change? Well, uh, as far as the U.S. goes, uh, New England is an area where um, we are seeing this decreasing snow and uh, uh, snow in the winter time. So we are seeing some some of the impacts of um, of this amplification due to the losses of snow and ice. That's one of the reasons why winters are warming so much. Is because think about this spring. We really didn't have much snow in February and March. So the springtime has less snow to reflect the energy away, more darker surfaces. So relative to the rest of the country, it's projected that the, the Northeast US will reach, let's say a doubling uh, or uh, our warming moving forward by mid-century, we'll warm more in the Northeast US than the rest of the country. And we believe that's likely due to this losing snow and ice. If you think about relative to the Southwest US that doesn't have a lot of snow and ice. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, there are plenty of questions in the chat, chat box. You can see that, but we won't be having time. So can you put your uh, email um, address on the chat box so that if people have Additional questions, they can always reach out to you. I will. Okay, awesome. Uh, our, we'll move on into our next speaker. Uh, um, our next speaker is Dr. Susanna Lerman. Uh, Susanna is with uh, USDA Forest Service, uh, is a research ecologist um, and also an adjunct research professor with the University of Massachusetts. So Susanna, take it away. Great, thanks so much, Tim. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. All right, and see here. Okay, so we got that all set up there. 
Perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much, Timothy, for the invitation to share some, some of my research about biodiversity, specifically about backyard habitats for bees. So I wanna put everybody into the mood here and to think about um, what I hope I will be doing in June is enjoying some strawberries, some fresh strawberries. And if we, if we all think about if we like strawberries, then we really need to thank bees for um, them helping us provide these um, great resources for us. When we think about bees and other animal pollinators, they're providing an incredible service in terms of pollination. So they pollinate roughly 87% of all flowering plants with bees being the, the primary pollinators um, in these systems. Um, but then getting back to the foods that we eat, bees provide a $56 billion service every year in the United States um, in terms of all the work they do for pollinating our crops. So again, if you like to eat, chances are um, you can thank bees to help out with that. So we really do need bees to, um, to help us. But bees also need us. Um, for the last 10 plus years, we've been seeing report after report in the news and science magazines and um, different types of media posts that bees are in trouble. Um, the two main reasons why we're seeing this really strong decline of bees uh, is because of agricultural intensification and habitat loss. And this is happening at a global scale. Um, and so it's not just unique to the United States. So we're seeing this all over the planet. Um, however, in addition to habitat loss from things like urban development, there's also habitat gains from deliberately planting pollinator gardens. And these can vary a great deal. In addition to being planted in yards um, and also found in parks, schoolyards, and state houses. For example, there's a, a really wonderful program called Mayors for Monarchs, um, where mayors across the United States have committed to planting pollinator gardens. So when we think about yards, um, the idea of yards as serving as wildlife habitat is not new and has been around for more than 50 years. Um, in 1973, there's this wonderful publication co-authored by two U.S. Forest Service scientists, Jack Ward Thomas and Dick DeGraff. Both of them um, were stationed in the UMass Amherst office back in the 70s and 80s. And this publication really revolutionized our way of thinking about wildlife habitat. Um, this was one of the first publications to provide a how to create wildlife habitat in your yard, such as what plants to include, what to expect over a 40 year period, time frame. And this publication inspired programs like the National Wildlife uh, Federation's Backyard Habitat Certification Program, which has more than 250,000 certified yards. The National Audubon Society has a similar program, as well as many state um, extension agencies and other wildlife um, organizations as well. Um, but what a, most of these um, programs are really trying to promote and the recommendations are to include planting native plants and removing or significantly reducing your lawn. Now let's talk about lawns. These are the most common feature in a residential yard. Um, they cover more than 163,800 square kilometers. So what does that mean? So that's the equivalent to the size of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts combined. Uh, so it's a lot of area. And I have a couple of other stats here on the screen in terms of you know, their extent. Um, they're the largest irrigated crop in the United States, and they cover roughly 2% of our US land base. Um, and they contribute to a significant component of urban and suburban lands, and particularly in our residential parcels. So they take up a lot of space. Um, and because of their, um, the monoculture and the amount of inputs like fertilizers and pesticides that we put into our lawns, many of my colleagues have vilified or dismissed these lawns as habitat um, due to the way that they look here. And I have here um, a, a really great quote from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, in terms of referencing these as biological, or sorry, biodiversity deserts, um, and they're relatively useless for birds and bees. So I too uh, flew this flag and considered lawns as non-habitat, um, but I kept coming back to this number of 163,800 square kilometers. And I recognized that we weren't going to completely remove lawns from the landscape. So I started developing a new mantra. 
How do we make these lawns less bad? And I started uh, delving deeper into understanding what goes into these lawns and um, really started to understand whether there's different opportunities for us to change the way that we manage these green spaces. Um, because I recognize that they all have ecological consequences. And these management decisions can vary at temporal scales, including daily irrigation, weekly mowing, or seasonal application of chemicals. However, based on an extensive household survey in the United States on lawn management practices, we know that not everyone is irrigating and fertilizing their lawns, yet almost all Americans are mowing their lawns and many towns have ordinances and rules and um, different laws in places um, ensuring that the grass height does not exceed a certain height. And so why do we mow our lawns? So it's primarily for aesthetic reasons. And when we look at the historical context of lawn mowing, particularly from the 1950s, we can see that managing our lawns was really an extension of manning, managing our home. However, every time we mow, we could be potentially removing some habitat, having negative consequences for bees and other pollinators who might be using the floral resources. And so here I have a, a picture of a, on the bottom right hand corner of a bumblebee using um, a dandelion. Some of these might, some people might consider these weeds. I like to consider it as, as potential habitat. And it's about 10 years ago when my family and I, we bought our first house and we were now responsible for caring for the lawn. It was my husband's turn to, to mow. And I noticed after he finished that he had left um, large patches of the lawn unmowed. And when I went over to check why he, he had done this, I saw that these patches were riddled with, with small flowers. And when I looked even closer, I noticed um, that there were a few bumblebees buzzing around and I had one of those aha moments um, that scientists often have and I started to look at lawns in a different way and with this aha moment I designed a study that um, that could really test the natural history and the the value of lawn dominated yards for bees and, and other pollinators and so I designed a study to in fact to look at this and also to test the hypothesis that if we mow our lawns less frequently, do we have more lawn flowers, things like dandelion, clover, and, and violets and other types of um, spontaneous species? And if we have more flowers, do we have more bees? And so I conducted this research in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, for those of you not from, from Massachusetts, this is the third largest uh, city in the, the Commonwealth, the state of Massachusetts. And the study took place in 2013, 2014, and I worked in 16 different lawn dominated yards. And I'm gonna refer to these as lawn dominated yards, meaning that um, the picture on the left was one of the sites where I conducted the research. And so these were yards that did not have special plantings that were specifically meant for pollinators. And for these um, different yards, they were divided into three different lawn mowing frequency categories. So they were mowed either every week, every two weeks, or every three weeks. Now, when you're doing experiments in, um, in ecology, especially out in the wild, it's really important to try to control as many of the different factors as possible so that we can really understand um, the key component that we're testing. So I wanted to make sure that all the lawns were treated in the same way. So all the, the yards that we were working in, the householders had to agree not to irrigate or fertilize during the course of the study. But the main question that I was really interested in was the lawn mowing frequency. And so in order to ensure that, uh, that the yards adhered to their frequency um, component that I had signed them to, we provided free lawn mowing service over the course of two years. Uh, and so this, this part was a um, really fun component. Uh, the householders that were participating in the study really enjoyed this part of the study. Um, but as a little side note um, to note that we mowed a lot of lawns. And so that was the equivalent of walking from Springfield, Massachusetts down to Philadelphia and back. And in fact, the yard I have pictured in the top left corner, this was a yard that was mowed every week um, over the course of two years. And we clocked in 75 miles of just pushing our lawnmower. Um, and so again, really kind of demonstrates that 
Um, there are some benefits if you are the one who's pushing the lawnmower in terms of the amount of exercise you can have for mowing. But in terms of the data that we collected um, in all of these yards, um, just prior to mowing, we um, went in and collected and counted how many different types of flowers were flowering in the lawns and also other flowers in the yard so we could account for that. And we looked at how many bees and which types of bees were present in these yards using two different methods um, that I have shown here in the middle of collecting bees using small little um, plastic cups and then using a, a bee net to run around the yards um, swiping at bees to see who's there. And so what did we find? So in terms of the different types of lawn flowers, um, we had a, an extraordinary amount of diversity. So we identified 58 different species in these 16 lawns in Springfield. Um, most of these species were native to North America and I have listed in the top left some of the, the top 10 uh, most common species that were found throughout these 16 yards. Um, in terms of whether or not lawn mowing influenced the abundance, we did find that yes, it, they did. And so when you mow your lawns less frequently every three weeks, you have more uh, lawn flowers. And so the way you would read this um, figure in the bottom right hand corner, we have the three different mowing regimes on the X axis and then the lawn flower abundance on the Y axis. And so there is a significant difference um, when we looked at the lawn flowers. In terms of bee diversity, when we think about the natural history of these lawns, um, it was also pretty extraordinary. And even though the study took place almost 10 years ago, I'm still in awe with what we found. So we identified 111 different species of bee um, in these 16 yards. Again, a reminder of what these lawns looked like, what these yards looked like. And this 111 species represents uh, roughly a quarter of all um, species of bee that have been recorded in the state of Massachusetts. So that's incredible amounts of diversity and roughly 35 species per yard. Um, we identified a number of county records, bees that had never been re um, recorded in Hamden County before. And the bee that I have um, shown here on the right, Lazioglossum ilioense, it's a um, very drab, boring looking bee. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, but regardless, this was the most abundant bee that we um, identified in these yards. And what's really interesting about this species is that it had yet to be recorded um, in the Western part of the state. Only two records exist. Um, and those were from the 1920s and were um, collected in the Eastern part of the state. Uh, we did some genetic analysis to see if there's anything really interesting about it. Um, it wasn't, but nonetheless, it was really exciting to have this new visitor and a, a species that had probably been um, present under our eyes, but nobody had really thought to look at these lawns because they had dismissed them. In terms of some of the traits of the bees that we had, um, most of them were native to North America. Most of them were from the family Helictidae. Uh, most of them are nesting in the ground, in the soil, and most of them are um, generalist species. So they're going to be taking pollen and nectar from a variety of different flowers rather than specializing on, on one or two um, species or families. But pie charts are, are interesting, but I really want us to just take a moment and celebrate the extreme diversity that we saw um, and just to enjoy some of the, um, the different colors and different um, uh, sizes of these bees. And so if you have a moment, I, I strongly recommend looking up Sam Drogi's, um, I think this is his um, Instagram site where he has these great photographs of, of different types of bees. But in terms of going back to the um, hypothesis that we tested, if you have more lawn flowers, which we found we um, did when you mow less frequently, do you have more bees? And the, the figure on the right demonstrates that yes, in fact, we do. And we saw that um, the yards that were mowed every two weeks had the highest abundance of bees. So they supported the most bees um, in these 16 different lawns. And this was primarily because they had a higher abundance of lawn flowers. And although we didn't see um, the yards that were mowed every three weeks having the highest abundance of bees, one of the things that we, we think is happening here is that with the yards that are mowed every two weeks, they um, get away, please. Um, every two weeks that they, um, uh, every two weeks, they, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, 
the lot the grass height was um, much taller and they um, made it a little bit more difficult for the bees to access the flowers because um, these are really small flowers and so that's what we think might be happening. I want to take a, a small little detour here um, and talk about some of these ecosystem disservices that might be happening. Um, and so when I was designing this study, um, one of the questions that I had from people was, well, if you have these taller grasses, um, what about the ticks? You're going to have ticks. And we heard about ticks um, in the previous talk from, from Michael talking about in, um, the increase of ticks because of climate change. And this is a serious concern in Massachusetts with uh, Lyme disease and tick, um, other tick-borne diseases that are common um, throughout the United States and other parts of the world. And so similar to the lawn mowing frequency study, also tested a similar hypothesis. If you mow less, do you have more ticks? And so this is the way that, um, that we were able to collect the ticks, um, to look at uh, the different lawn mowing frequencies and to see whether or not ticks were responding to um, different heights of grass. And so I wanna pause for a second and have everybody think about how many ticks did we collect during the course of the study? So here is the numbers, just I will read it, you know, 46% of you said 1000 ticks, 31% said 50,000 ticks, 25% 100, 9% said 50 ticks, and then 2% said zero. All right, so the 2%, you are correct. Um, so we found zero ticks. And so just to, you know, for those of you in, in Western Massachusetts and Springfield, we know ticks are present. So I, I had shelved these data for a while. And then a couple of years ago, um, the magazine, The Consumer Reports came out with an article about how to tick proof your yard without spraying. And their number one recommendation was to keep your lawns short. Um, and I have here the math um, for those of you um, working in inches and to um, translate to centimeters. And this um, equates to the yards that are mowed every week. And so if Consumer Reports is re recommending um, people with their lawns to keep them really short, it could have these unintentional consequences for bees. And so it's really important to um, put this into context and that for yards that are surrounded by forest, as I have indicated on the left, um, there's a higher likelihood of um, coming into contact with ticks. And so we really have to acknowledge and, um, the limitations of the research, whereas the yards on the right-hand side, there's less of a chance of having these interactions with ticks and therefore mowing your lawn um, more frequently is not going to change um, the abundance of ticks and it also could have these negative consequences for bees. So going back to this question, um, are these biological deserts? If it were up to me, I would wish all of our yards look something like this, but I know that this is not something that everybody wants. And so um, in addition to planting pollinator gardens, what we're recommending is that people can do less. They can mow their lawns less frequently. Um, and we're calling this the lazy lawnmower approach. Um, it's economical, it's time-saving, and it's simple. And it's something that everybody can do. And when we think about managing our lawns, um, it can go across not just in urban and suburban areas, but also in these, agri um, in these rural yards as well, especially when they are next to these agricultural fields. Um, and then also to think beyond our yards that we're managing lawns um, in a whole bunch of different types of um, different systems. And I just want to end um, with a, a quote from Obi-Wan Kenobi about lawn mowing and, um, and dandelions. Uh, and I also would like to thank um, all of my collaborators, the householders, and I have my website on the bottom here if you want to download a, a lawn sign um, to let your neighbors know that you too are mowing less frequently so that you can provide bee habitat. So thank you very much. And let me know if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, so one, one question, I, I, I think I had, you have so many questions in the chat, chat room. I think you, if you, if you can uh, respond to them after, when you're at your convenience, but maybe I highlight one now. Uh, what are some of the plant species uh, you could select to enhance pollinators? So what we're finding um, is that there, there's so many plants in the seed bank, um, and so they're, they're available already. 
Um, there's a couple of other programs out there. So the University of Minnesota has a bee lawn program um, where it's a, a mix of different types of, of grasses and flowers. So clover is, is really wonderful for bees. Um, and so that's one thing to include in there. Um, but there, it's also very specific to your climate and to, to your region. And so, as I mentioned earlier about all of these different wildlife gardening programs, they have lists of different plants that are really good for bees, for birds, and, and other types of wildlife. Um, so in, in general, the general rule is um, if you're trying to select plants for your yard, try to see what's out in the, the more natural wild areas in your um, close by, because that's going to give a great indication of what plants really want to be there and what plants really have a great chance of, of um, existing and persisting. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, for the attendees, you know, uh, uh, it, your, you know, your questions are excellent. Uh, we will try to address each one. I think uh, our panelists will try to respond to each one of the questions as and as as much as possible. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, you know more questions, you can always email uh, the panelists directly if you want to. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Jun Yao. Um, Dr. Jun Yao is a assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering. Uh, he'll be talking about electricity out of thin air. Take it away, Jun. All right, everybody, can you hear me? Good? Yes. And you can see the slide, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jun Yao. I'm a junior faculty at the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at UMass Amherst. And thank you, Timothy, for the invitation and the introduction and also Rina for the invitation. So I joined the UMass about I mean, 3.5 years ago, I believe. So, so our research group is relatively young. Um, I think after hearing Michael's talk, I, I, I think everybody agrees that uh, green energy is important <laughs> uh, for various reasons. So, so I think today we, I, I'm, I'm just gonna have something uh, that seem to be uh, exciting and hopefully can contribute to uh, this green energy category. So I'm gonna share with you. Um, and, and I put the title as uh, electricity from air, that it means that we're gonna get electricity from air. So um, now, you know, one may wonder how come the air has electricity, but, but in fact, the yes, the air has electricity. Uh, we actually can know that from our daily life experience. Uh, for example, during a thunderstorm, uh, the lightning in the air uh, is the electricity. It lasts less than one thousandth of a second. Okay, so just a quick flash, but it actually contains about one billion Okay, that's one nine zero after one joule of electricity. What does that mean? It means that you can use that blink of lighting to light up a bulb, okay, a lamp in your home for one year without stop. Now, people did a statistic every year, they are actually uh, estimated to be billions of lightnings happening here and there across the world. So if you multiply the two numbers, you will find that each year the lightning coming from the air can produce, uh, let's say, billion billion joule. That's that's uh, eighteen zeros. Okay, after one of electricity. Now, how much is that? Uh, it's actually close to the annual electricity consumption by all the households in U.S. So this means that if we can get electricity from the air, it can be a big deal. It can be a big deal. <clears throat> Now, why there is electricity coming out of the air? Uh, the, the ground in a thunderstorm basically is made of many small water droplets. Jo water droplets. And some of them are moving upward and others downwards. So they uh, collide with each other. This kind of process generates the charge okay, on their surface. And this is called electrification, uh, which we actually are quite familiar with because we know that sometimes when we uh, take off a sweater uh, during winter time, it will create it will create the sparkles. These kind of sparkles are electricity coming from 
uh, the rubbing of the uh, sweaters. So here, of course, the water droplets rub against each other to generate uh, the charges. And it turns out that the uh, water droplets are carrying the positive charge. Uh, they tend to move upward, whereas the ones carrying the negative charge uh, tended to move downward. So in the end, you can imagine there would be charge separation uh, inside the ground uh, with the upside full of positive charges and the downside, you know, negative charges. And if, if of course, the, when the charge amount is too high, they will find a way uh, to leak out through the air to the ground, so forming the lightning. <laughs> I believe many of you may have heard of uh, uh, Franklin's kite experiment, right? Uh, Franklin's uh, kite experiment. By using the rope, uh, you know, to collect the electricity uh, from the ground to a device called the Leyden jar, which essentially is an older form of battery uh, to store the electricity. It, it, it actually is argued that uh, frankly could not have done uh, this with the visible light <laughs> or because all he could have died from it since the visible light is too strong. But, but anyway, I would say the take home message here is that the one, the air water or actually the humidity <laughs> more precisely carries a larger amount of charge uh, to form the electricity. The second is that to date, we actually don't know how we can capture uh, these electricity in a, in a controllable way. Okay. Now, lightning actually is a macro scale world effect. We actually see with our bare eye, right? Uh, let me just switch the focus a little bit uh, to the micro scale world, uh, which uh, basically cannot be uh, directed seen by our eyes. And eventually I will show you how we can connect the dots. Okay. And I think we know that our world is full of uh, bacteria. Uh, there is a type of bacteria, uh, it's called a geobacter, uh, that was discovered by an UMass uh, microbiologist, okay. Derek Lovely, uh, I, I think about uh, close to four decades ago. Uh, they live in the river mud. Uh, so what what make them kind of special is that they, you, you see that they have a, a, those bunch of tails, okay? They have these bunch of tails. <clears throat> now, uh, to give some more idea about the size, I wanted to uh, make some comparison, okay? Uh, shown here uh, is th this kind of tree trunk-like structure, okay? It's not a tree trunk, it's actually a human hair. <laughs> Um, of course, it's, it's zoomed in many, many times by using a special uh, microscope, okay? Now, you can imagine, okay, at the one to one ratio, a geobacter, a bacteria, is really like this big, okay? So you can imagine how small these tails are. Now, at such a small scale, uh, we don't usually typically uh, I use the lens as a meter for uh, measuring things. Now, instead, uh, we use the scale uh, nanometer to measure things. A nanometer is a one billionth, okay? Uh, that's 0 0.0090, okay? One billionth of a meter. Uh, so using that unit, the diameter of a human hair is about, let's say, close to 100 thousand nanometers, but the diameter of this bacterial tail uh, is only about three nanometers. So you can see that, that that's more than uh, 10,000 times smaller uh, than a human hair, okay? So we call it the uh, nano Y, nano Y, okay? The word nano indicate its small size. It's getting to the nanometer scale, while as wine uh, still indicates its geometry because it's just like a wine, right? Uh, it's, now, of course, it's made of protein from a living creature. So we call it the uh, protein nanowire, okay? <clears throat> now, 
why the bacteria uh, make these protein nanowires, okay? Now under the microscope, you will see that these bacteria, they tether together, okay, uh, by these protein nanowires. They actually use the protein nanowires as in a communication uh, cable, okay? So they can in exchange information or energy with one another. Now, the information or energy essentially is carried by electricity, which means that the protein nanowires are specifically designed for the bacteria to retrieve electricity in the water environment, okay? Now, if we think about that, this problem is gonna give us some inspiration, right? Because now we can think, think maybe we can borrow them to retrieve electricity from the water in the air. Can we do that? Can we do that, right? Of course, in order to do that, uh, the first thing is that we needed to harvest uh, many, many of those uh, protein nanowires. Now, how we do that? Imagine that uh, <clears throat> uh, we put the many of those bacteria uh, in a blender, okay, uh, which will destroy uh, the, the body of the bacteria, but, but things, these protein nanowires, they are relatively stronger, so they retain. And then we can filter them out. So that's the general strategy, how we can harvest these uh, tiny little uh, protein nanowires and, and you know, purify them. Now, we can put them together to make a thin film, okay? Uh, the thickness of this type of thin film is only about, uh, let's say, tenths of the diameter of a human hair. Uh, so, so you can imagine one such uh, thin film actually contains billions of these tiny little protein nanowires, okay? <clears throat> now, then we can sandwich uh, the film, okay, made from these many, many protein nanowires between a pair of electrodes. Uh, the top electrode uh, uh, is relatively smaller so that the, the film surface uh, is exposed uh, to the ambient air or humidity, okay? And then, so here's a video. Uh, we can use a, a, a voltmeter. We know that the voltmeter measures the vo voltage. So we can use a voltmeter to measure uh, the voltage between the two electrodes. And we get the reading, as you can see here, about 500 millivolt, okay, it's millivolt. So it's about 0.5 volt. So which means that the, there is electric energy coming out. And we call this device the air gen because uh, essentially we are generating electricity from the air. <clears throat> now, if you want, uh, this device is kind of similar to a battery because we know that, uh, uh, you know, on a triple A battery, you can often see that it labels, for example, 1.5 volt, right? which means that if you use a voltmeter to measure uh, the uh, voltage between the positive and negative term, you will get them to read uh, 1.5 volt. Uh, we find that uh, you know, as long as we put the air gene in the ambient air, okay, uh, the voltage does not decay. So the, here, what we, what we show here at the bottom uh, is a continuous measurement. Okay, of the voltage uh, from the air gene for over two months, you will see that curve basically stays, uh, meaning that, that there's a continuous electricity coming out. Now, actually we know that the battery actually <laughs> runs out, but here uh, the air gene actually uh, is, is continuously generating electricity. Okay? The air gene actually is continuously generating electricity. Um, we also know that, that the, if we connect the several batteries together, okay, we can increase the voltage output, right? Uh, so, so you can imagine you can put the, use three AAA battery uh, to get the 4.5 volt, right, volt uh, output. So it is same here, we can connect uh, many of these energy agent devices together. We can get the voltage, for example, in this case, close to 10 volt which can generally match, you know, uh, uh, to many portable electronics. Again, 
so here is a real time recording. You see that the curve actually reads a, a close to 10 volt. And now you see on the table that, that, that there are over 10 of those edge and device we connected together to increase the voltage. Okay. On the table, you see that we connected uh, over 10 of those edging device to, to, for, for this voltage output. <clears throat> now, usually people uh, believe uh, there's electricity coming out only when they see uh, something's lit up, okay? <laughs> so um, now uh, remember that the energy coming from the edge and, uh, at the very small size is relatively small, so we can use a capacitor to collect these electricity from the edging devices and then use them to light up an LED or LCD, which, which really is a, is a way, uh, easy way to show people that, that, that the electricity is real, okay? You know, other than by seeing a curve. This is a much more direct way. <clears throat> now, let me just go back to give you some general idea how uh, the edging works by referring, let's say, to the lightning again. Uh, the key for generating lightning is that there is a charge separation, as I you know, mentioned before, uh, in the crowd. Now, if we look at the edging structure uh, at the bottom of this, you know, the figure, okay, the bottom, let's look at the edging structure. Uh, its top surface is exposed to the air, but the bottom actually is sealed by a substrate, right? So it's an asymmetric structure. So only the top interface is exposed to the ambient humidity. So I made a case before that, that these protein nanowires from the bacteria, uh, they are specifically designed to have a charge in the water. Uh, so you can imagine that the top nanowire interface or the top film interface will receive more charge than the bottom, right? Because the to top has a direct Exposure to uh, to the ambient humidity while the bottom is sealed. So this will create the charge separation. The charge separation will then lead to charge flow or electricity. Now, <clears throat> so we can now turn to a solar panel to the quick you know uh, comparison or experiment uh, to verify this energy source. We know that uh, a solar panel converts sunlight right into electricity, which means that if we block the sunlight, the electricity is gone. Now in this engine, in a similar way, if you seal the top interface to block the humidity, you will see that the electricity is gone. But once you remove the seal, uh, the electricity restores. So this is again, a simple way to show people that the, the electricity really is coming from the air uh, more precisely precisely the uh, water component or the humidity component uh, in the air. Now, I like this cartoon. Okay? <laughs> so in a way, <laughs> you can imagine that uh, the air gene really is a small scale man-made crowd. Okay? It's a small scale man-made crowd, uh, which can induce charge separation in itself to generate the electricity in a much more controllable way. Uh, uh, so, which means that now we really can harvest uh, these electricity in the air for real use, okay, for real use. Um, I will show you some uh, uh, cool application, okay, small scale application uh, based on this uh, air gen. Uh, the air gen uh, device is very thin, as I said, you know, it's, it's less than tens of the diameter of a human hair. So they can be placed on a flexible substrate to stick to human skin, okay? Now we know that the human body actually is a very rich humidity source, right? So if you place that close to your nose, uh, it will convert uh, the humidity coming from your breeze into electricity. And of course that will have vibration uh, pattern, right? Uh, so that vibration pattern can be used, of course, to monitor uh, your respiratory rate. Now, of course, if it can also be placed on your other body, other parts of your body. It can tell whether your skin is in hydration or dehydration state, okay? So they can be used for health monitoring, okay? Um, at no electricity cost because it's all coming from uh, the humidity, 
okay, coming coming out from your your body. <clears throat> now you can also make an array of those aging devices. Okay, uh, human body uh, constantly secretes humidity. So if you move your body parts, for example, your finger around this device, they can detect <laughs> where your finger is uh, because your fingertip uh, secretes uh, uh, humidity. Uh, so this process is a non-contact, okay? So this is that they can sense your finger without uh, a direct contact. Now we may appreciate <laughs> more uh, the importance of this type of uh, a remote detection uh, during this pandemic time because uh, we are more careful than wanted to touch on, you know, things uh, to, to uh, get contaminated, right? <clears throat> so finally, I, I just wanted to give a broad, you know, perspective about the potential. As I, as I said, you know, this is really at the very beginning stage, but uh, I think things seem to be very uh, exciting and promising. Let me just throw out uh, some numbers, okay? Uh, our Earth, we know that is surrounded by a very thick layer of uh, atmospheric humidity. And the, the contained water amount uh, is actually um, equivalent to 10% of the total uh, fresh, fresh lakes in the wood. Uh, so they contain, uh, if you do a simple calculation, probably 1,000 billion billion joule of energy. That is actually one. Uh, uh, 21 zeros, okay, after one, okay. That actually is larger than the global electricity consumption each year. So this can be a huge uh, electricity source. Uh, we know that we like a solar panel because it doesn't produce uh, pro pollution or, you know, all those greenhouse gases. And, you know, so, so it's a clean, energy, okay, it's a clean energy source. Now, uh, still, they tend to take up a big space, we know, right, in an open area, uh, because essentially you cannot stack them up uh, to save space. But the agent uh, is different. You can stack them up to save space because, because we know that the humidity is actually diffusive, okay? They can go anywhere, so in principle, you can get more electricity than a solar panel in a unit space if we, if we can stack enough of those aging layers together. Now, more always that we know that solar panel stops working during night, right? Uh, but the aging is 24 seven because humidity is always around, right? It's 24 seven, it's ubiquitous, it's continuous. Um, to get there, you know that we need many, many <laughs> tons of uh, protein analyzer. Now, can we do that? <laughs> I would say in principle, yes, because we know from our daily life experience that the bacteria grows faster, right? They, they grow fast. Uh, sometimes we know that it's actually more difficult to stop them from growing than uh, letting them grow. So in principle, we can grow tons of tons of bacteria to have is these protein analyzer. And in fact, the add on value uh, is that we know uh, solar cell, they produce a so-called e-waste, okay? Which means that once you then need them, uh, just like computer, they, they, you know, you need to recycle them. That costs the energy, okay? That actually can cost, uh, cause environmental uh, uh, pollution. But this material, okay, the protein analyzer, uh, they come from the bacteria, they, they, so they then uh, cause trouble uh, to the natural world. Uh, so so I, I call that, the, you know, by doing so, we may get the even greener, okay, greener energy. So I think I will stop here. Of course, he has a, a acknowledge, acknowledgements, you know, all the colleagues um, involved uh, in this type of, uh, I would say, very exciting research. And, uh, you know, I also wanted to acknowledge the funding agency. Uh, I will stop now. So see if there's a, a, you know questions I can uh, answer. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Junyo. Um, so we have several questions for you in the chat box. If you can hang around and answer each one of them, but just to uh, highlight one, um, there's a question from India. 
Dr. Shiny Febina is asking about what is the economics be, uh, in terms of uh, extracting current from the air? Is there any economic estimates? Um, we haven't. Um, we haven't done so because as you see that this is a really uh, very recent discovery and the, you know the scientific paper was published just last year okay so we you know honest speaking we just uh, uh, did some lab scale small device uh, estimate and, and I mean device uh, de you know proof concept device demonstration so we haven't actually calculated the real economic cost in this device but but let me let me give you an example okay the, i think when initially the solar panel uh, rolled out back in the 1970s uh, the cost is uh, above a hundred dollars uh per watt per watt okay over the past decade that number reduced to uh below one dollar per watt so it's orders of magnitude re reduction. So, so the thing is that if you see that this technology is promising, beneficial, I'm sure there will be multiple ways that we can reduce the cost. And in this technology, I just think, I see that it's even more uh, promising. As I said, it seems, turns out to be a greener technology. Okay, that's my general impression. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yao. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ellen Kelsey. Um, uh, Dr. Kelsey is a Carson Fellow, also a faculty in the University of Victoria, widely published as well as a uh, uh, lot of uh, information on the YouTube. You can contact her, but, but uh, without further ado, Dr. Kelsey. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you to all the speakers and to Rena and Timothy for putting together this amazing program. I. Um, I'm just wrapped with interest. <laughs> so many great examples and, and the diversity of ideas and ways that students who are listening might imagine their futures in any of these areas. So really, really wonderful. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here and hit present. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Yep. So I would like to begin very much by acknowledging the Lekwungen peoples on whose territory I'm speaking to you from today. Um, it's just a, a wonderful privilege, uh, especially to recognize the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasonic peoples whose relationship to this land continues to this day. Um, I'm the author of this book, Hope Matters, and I, I put this up only because many of the ideas I'm going to speak with you about are in this book. So if you want to look more deeply into some of these things, you can find them. Here, this book just came out this year. I wanted to start just by asking how you are feeling. If you can just take a few moments as I'm speaking, just to think about how you're feeling. I think that's a critically important question to ask ourselves all the time um, because it means that we're paying attention to ourselves. And also because when it comes to the environment, we are constantly bombarded with headlines like this, you know, things. And the number one way that we hear about the environment is through the media. So in this particular case, we see here, you know, um, the wildfires in California and tragically, you know, burning a sign about COVID-19. That's a very dramatic image and it leaves an impression on us. In fact, many people feel like this and maybe sometimes you feel like this. In fact, many researchers are now looking at what we call eco-emotions. How do we feel about um, the state of the planet? And this is some work done by a Finnish researcher, Penu Pekala. I myself have been asking students for many years how they feel when they think about the environment. And I just wanted to show you here on the left are some of the words students regularly use. And on the right is a researcher who is asking crisis reporters in the midst of um, reporting on famines and earthquakes and school shootings, how they feel, and you'll notice very similar words. So the level of um, emotion and feelings that we have around the state of the planet is very high. In fact, if you look across the psychological literature, you'll find all kinds of new terms coming out to try to talk about the ways that we feel. And it, it makes sense that we have strong feelings of worry and concern because just as we heard at the beginning of this session, these are real problems of global proportions. And 
we feel this way because almost all the news that we hear both in our scientific journals and in the mass media is in a problem identification. We rarely hear about solutions that are actually happening. That's because of things like this, you know, problems caused by climate change are deemed more newsworthy than solutions by major media outlets all over the world. Um, we know that in our in our habits around the media, we've really changed so that we are we are really confronted by news about the state of the planet, you know, 24 hours of the day on our personal devices. And in fact, doom scrolling, which many of you will be familiar with, was a word of the year in 2020, something that happens all the time. Um, we know, too, that there's an urgency around these issues like climate change. And because of that, we tend to see repeated ideas that are important around urgency. But when we're focusing so much on the problems and the urgency of the problems, we do that because we kind of have this assumption that we simply have to get the word out. And if people knew better, they would act better. You know, that's what underscores that. But what happens if people already do know better? And in fact, if you look at recent research, this is just, you'll notice that all my slides will always have dates on them. This is just from January, 2021. We're seeing here levels of concern and awareness about climate change are higher than they've ever been in countries all over the world and in the United States. You know, So that's been an increasing um, high levels of concern, high levels of awareness. And why that's important is because our feelings about something are based on the reality of the situation and they're based on our mindsets and our thoughts and our beliefs, right? And, and that all is, comes down to how things are communicated. Our subjective beliefs, how we feel actually impacts objective reality. And so for example, we see here in January, 2021, how you think about the effectiveness of the vaccine for COVID-19 has an impact on your immune response. You know, your subjective beliefs actually impact how well that vaccine will work in your body. And this has led some journalists to say, you know, is all this doom and gloom that we're focusing on these problem identification actually actively disengaging people from being involved with climate change? We see other researchers who say things like this, you know, when we focus only on doom and gloom, we actually cause people to feel paralyzed and to feel like there's nothing that can be done about the problem. The point around this is that if we assume a fatalistic perspective and we think that hopelessness is a bygone conclusion, just as Rena said at the beginning, then we actually cause ourselves to be much less, uh, we have much less agency. So there's actually collateral damage of focusing only on doom and gloom. We know that hopelessness in the psychological literature is tied to cynicism, and we see a growing rise of cynicism and a sense of apathy, like we can't do anything about it. Um, Tony Lazowitz at Yale University has actually named this the hope gap between our fears and commitment to what's happening and our sense of powerlessness about being able to do anything about it. And in a recent research, this is from 2020, um, across Canada, students between grades seven and 12 were very aware of climate change, knew that it was human caused in more recent years, but 46% of them believed there was nothing that could be done to change it. So here's a poll, and I'm gonna keep talking as the poll is going, and Timothy, if you could just let me know the results, I'd love it when you've got them. So do you recognize this hope gap um, in yourself or in the people that you are spending time with. And I think, can we move forward with that, Timothy? Maybe I'll take the poll off because I think it's going to freeze my screen. We can, you can just answer in the chat if you wouldn't mind. That's great. Is that possible, Timothy? Yes, uh, I'm, it's five seconds. I'll be ending the poll. Is oh, you're okay? so good. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. So 87% um, said yes. And 13% yeah. said no. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Yeah, I think it's a really important issue uh, because it, it speaks just to what Rena said about whether we feel we can move forward with things. Um, it seems like I can't progress now. Oh, there we are. <laughs> thank you. So all of this to say that emotions really matter. I'm currently involved in a project which will be online in the next month, uh, which is a whole group of international academics putting together resources uh, of ways of talking about our feelings for educators and students um, in safe ways so that we have ways of expressing how we're feeling around all of these issues. 
one of the people contributing to this is Lisa Kratz, who talks about giving voice to outlaw emotions, that in fact, we need to speak not only about uh, emotions like hopefulness, but also anger and grief and despair, the whole range of emotions all goes together. And what we do know is that both hope and anger are very activating emotions. When we feel those, we feel like taking action, whereas grief causes us to shut down and to, and to really feel like there's not much we can do. So hope is really important, and that's what I'm really interested in. And, and not really this Pollyanna-ish idea that, you know, everything will be fine and we only talk about the bright side. No, I'm talking about evidence-based hope, where we really face the realities of the situations, just as we were doing at the beginning um, with the talk that we started with today, and accepting this idea that we really don't know what is going to happen. We have predictions about what we think will happen, but there's so many more variables at play. Also, hope is really a collective thing. And again, Rena touched on this, that when we see ourselves involved with others who care about what we care about, it's very motivating. And research shows us that pride, for example, is really an important idea. When you look across the range of, of um, ways that people are engaged with um, environmental action, we've typically used fear and shame as our primary motivators. But it turns out that empathy, compassion, meaningful purpose, these are much more powerful uh, when it comes to causing us to engage with these really difficult issues that, that demand our time and attention. So to manage the hope gap, we really need to be thinking about our emotions and also to be engaged with time-stamped current information so that we can see positive trends as they're happening. So places where you can see this, uh, there's a huge field now called solutions journalism that spends as much time with evidence-based explorations about the problems we face as it does on the solutions that people are actively engaged with. So just as rigorous reporting on solutions as problems. You can go on the story tracker from the solutions journalism and look up issues that you're interested in and find out real-time stories going on around those around the world. Project Drawdown is a wonderful source too about what kinds of actions have the most impact in terms of climate change engagement. Um, things like food waste, for example, are at number four. So dealing with things that we're already talking about in our lives are very important. Here's a wonderful podcast that BBC World Service does called People Fixing the World. And there are a number of sources of sites that, that I personally check on a daily basis so I can see what's happening the reason that's important is we often feel like we're at the starting line. We talk about if we do this, then this will happen. I try really hard to talk about because we have been doing this, now these things are emerging. It places us in the sense that not all the hard work is ahead, much of the hard work has been done. And I think that our climate marches that we saw so active in 2019 are a great example of that. Many of you will have been involved in those, but what you may not realize is that coming out of those has been just a torrent of climate emergency declarations all over the world to the point where one in 10 people, people on the planet now live in a place that has declared a climate emergency. And what that means is action plans to deal with these issues. I was very excited when President Biden was elected that one of his first actions was to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. The reason I think that's so exciting is not only is that an important move, but also it shows that climate change is now seen as a, as a unifying issue for the United States. You know, it brings us together rather than a polarizing issue, which is how we used to think about it. We also see now, you know, in more recent times, talking about coming out of the pandemic and investing, just as, as we're saying, in climate-friendly actions. We see things like this in October 2020, that solar and wind energy has now eclipsed ExxonMobil as, as the largest company in the world. We see in March, uh, you know, Petaluma, California banning gas stations. They're allowed to keep the gas stations they have, but they can't add any more. And if they add to those gas stations, they can only add electric chargers, not um, gasoline pumps. Uh, here in Canada, we see pledges for public transit. Just uh, yesterday, France talking about banning short haul flights if there's a, an alternative where you can take by trains because of climate action. We've been tracing the incredible meteoric rise of bicycle use through the um, pandemic, it's really jumped up. We see countries now agreeing to net zero um, commitments. 
And you'll notice that was 77 countries last year up to 110 countries this year. So again, keeping track of change. And we see changes in scientific understanding about the state of climate change. So in this case, uh, recognizing that the actions we take will have an impact perhaps faster than we had imagined before. So this up-to-date information is really important. And we, it, a really key thing to do is to keep track of trends. So many students are involved and interested in the problem of single-use plastic. It helps to know that 170 countries have also pledged action around single-use plastic and are doing that in many different ways. Ocean optimism is a hashtag I co-created back in 2014. It's actively being populated. And we see things like this, where um, Scotland has had such success with single-use plastic charges in terms of reducing uh, beach plastic waste, that they're increasing those charges with the hope that it will have more impact. So emotions are contagious, both face-to-face -face and online. And that's why it's so important that we be sharing information as it's actually happening. One other key thing to talk about, and I'm so happy we're talking about bees, is there's 8.7 million other species on Earth, and they are actively involved in changing. So we see this resilience in the other than human world here just in April, this increase. I'm a children's book writer too, and all of my books are based on first-person interviews with scientists. So things like humpback whales are actually very social animals that uh, use tool use. They, they collectively hunt in ways that increase their results. And one of the researchers I talked to, um, Fred Sharp, told me that one reason humpbacks are having this remarkable global comeback is that they're actually really good social networkers. So as whale numbers are increasing, we also see that as a positive for the oceans. And in fact, uh, economists now talking about the benefits that we have because whales are actually really good at moving water up and down. That means more phytoplankton near the surface with net incre increases for capturing carbon. Uh, and ocean protection is on the rise. We see world leaders making commitments around uh, the intention to protect 25% of land and ocean by 2025, 30% by 2030. We see increases in the protection of biodiversity over time. And we see real interest in ecological restoration in order to make those 25 and 30%. Now, again, we have to hold people accountable. There's lots of work to be done to make that happen. But these commitments matter because they show a trend that we really want to be amplifying. Here in Canada, there's been a lot of focus in recent years on indigenous um, establishments of parks. And so again, the growing of the ways in which we do the kind of habitat protection that matters to all of us. I'm just gonna to touch on this quickly. This idea that trees um, are really incredible social networkers as well too. And many of you will be familiar with this of plants actually sharing energy between one another and how cities are, are catching on to this idea by thinking about their urban forests. Here's a, a map of, of Vancouver, for example, that shows areas where trees are in the city. That's important from a social justice standpoint because we know research like this, more trees actually means less crime in neighborhoods, all these interesting studies. And here just of this month, the idea of, um, you know, the more green spaces, better for our mental health, better for our physical health. So lots of changes going on in that way too. Now I just wanted to touch really quickly on this. Many people have been concerned that with the increase of attention on the pandemic, that in fact, we've seen a decrease in um, interest to climate change. In fact, that's not true. We're just in a media eclipse where we mostly hear about the pandemic, but climate change interest has stayed high, if not higher. We see in the financial pages, real investments now moving into climate change. Um, big numbers. We see people like Jeff Bezos and other companies like Amazon making commitments to meet the Paris Accords, but 10 years faster. And $10 billion in grants to organizations fighting climate change. The last thing I wanted to talk about is this. You are in the category of the largest demographic on earth. And the number one things that you and your colleagues care about, other youth, are social justice and climate change. So this climate justice activism is focused not just on sustainability, but on transformation. So we know that this interest we've seen before the pandemic and during is that 
larger social issues, putting people ahead of profits and environmental sustainability is a priority for that largest demographic on earth. Solar punk, many of you will follow this, you know, ideas about the better future and what it looks like when we do the things we want to. There are wonderful climate guides by students who are showing us that the importance of emotions and individuality in the way that we respond to climate. There's not one way. We see this art and science mashup happening now where here we have engagement in the arts and climate change is, is really part of the transformation that we need to see. That's great because during the pandemic, there's been a huge rise in arts. Um, you may be interested in this hashtag where you can see in your own area how climate warming has happened and then get an image of it and place it on anything that you want to place it on. Trains, ties, whatever that is. We see a rise of people knitting for wildlife, sewing for wildlife. Um, making ceramics to help the resilience of fishes in the ocean, uh, singing for the things that we believe in. And I just wanted to end with diversity and equity, really recognizing as we do so strongly that climate justice and, and climate change are so intimately tied together and seeing new guides like this one that talks about how do we cover climate change solutions, but from an equitable um, standpoint. All of this to say you have your own identity, your own wonderful identity that sits within a whole range of, of um, ideas and challenges. And so I've been excited in, in recent months to see the rise of this intersectional environmentalist council, for example, where people are choosing multiple sides of their identity to show their engagement with climate change. So acceptance of what is is not the same as fatalism about what's to come. Hope is not a complacent thing. It's a powerful political choice. So I hope that you will be a hope activist and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kelsey. It's, You're welcome. Uh, there, so there are um, several comments on the chat box. Um, they are actually uh, very exciting comments, but uh, I, I, I see very few questions, but feel free to go over them and see you know, if you can respond to them. Uh, um, and so, and I think I'm just looking for, uh, I mean, there are some questions which I think you, you can actually answer yeah. about some sort of a uh, data sets and all those things. So, uh, so I'm going to move on into our next presentation. Um, uh, I think I will, this is a, um, the whole bunch of competitions which were happening. So I'm going to hand it over to Rena. Um, so some of the things that you are not aware of. So our Sustainathon is a two-part event. So the first part is sustainability competition. So we had 18 teams, 18 teams from high schools and STIC students. They've been working together. They have been learning the scientific method. They chose a topic that they are passionate with. And uh, we had a little poster competition. So the the winners are going to share their research very briefly, you know, six minutes each so that we finish on time. Uh, don't go over the data tables, um, you know, go over your introduction, objective, or hypothesis, uh, and then uh, finish strong on with a conclusion. So six or seven minutes per team. Uh, I think it's Jonathan Palaf who's going to talk about this. They are like the cherry on the cake. I'm so proud of them. Very well done. Take away, Miranda. Um, should I start talking? Is Miranda yes, there? Yes, you can share your screen, yeah. Hi, um. Hold on, I just had to. Make it full screen, Miranda. Um, hello, this is Jonathan. Um, me, Miranda, Gamera, um, Nicole, and Sandra want to present how COVID impacts the environmental and human health. In this presentation, um, um, it's in Wuhan, China, and it's um, sorry, they started in Wuhan, China, and killed many people and infected even more. There was less pollution masks, uh, more pollution masks, and less pollution air and water. More people started wearing masks because they want to be protected and quarantine, social distancing, and movement restrictions were put into place to help control the spread of the virus. Because of these restrictions, there were less social economic activities. Industries shut down, and companies stopped working. 
In this study, we would like to show sustainable ideas to help control the um, self evident the bad effects of COVID and strengthen the good effects of it. We would also like to show how COVID changed widespread health. We have uh, we 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 researched positive and negative impacts to the environment, and uh, um, to the environment due to COVID nineteen, and demonstrate evidence of wellness fluctu and fluctuations in public health. We hypothesized the pandemic failed with COVID has benefited the environment, and the population has suffered immaculately and resulted in death rates. Now I'll pass on to Sandra. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, Sandra. Go ahead. Hello, I'm going to talk about methods. Our research methods include a review of scientific research paper and National Institutes of Health and World Health Organization. However, as we can see, we have collected two data of methods to show the COVID-19 infection, how they affect to great way in a better pollution and air quality. And however, you know, then we can see the public health got worsens, oh, worsens, millions of people are in fact, and half of the millions have died. And if we need to see the susceptibility due to, due to COVID-19 is the millions of death. However, to prevent from the infections, we already know, washing our hands, social distance, sanitizers, and avoid touching our face frequently. And in the other chart, as you can see, the symptoms of the COVID-19, um, the COVID-19 symptoms in, um, depends on how our body react to it. And some of the symptoms include dry mouth, fever, runny nose, loss of smell and taste, sore throat, shortness of breath, and headaches, body edges, exhalation, and diarrhea. Thank you, and I will be passing to Gomira. Hi, my name is Gomira, and I'll be going over the trends in the USA and the world. There has been over 32 million coronavirus cases in the world as of March 14th, 2021. There has been half a million deaths in the USA, and there has been 24 million that has recovered. The USA is among, uh, ranked among the highest in total cases among the world, and only 22% of our population in the USA are vaccinated as of March 14th, 2021. The graph on the bottom shows some positive impacts and negative impacts. Some positive impacts are that we have reduced transport and industrial activities, which has reduced noise pollution and improved our air quality. Some negative impacts are that we have increased municipal waste, which has caused air, water, and soil pollution. Now I'll pass it on to Miranda. Hi, my name is Miranda and I'll be talking about impacts on the environment and mitigation and vaccines. So we can see under impacts on the environment that COVID-19 improved air quality in just three months. And then the, the two pictures on the bottom are talking about a reduction in air pollution, specifically a reduction in nitrogen dioxide concentration. You can see that it's decreased greatly during the pandemic compared to before the pandemic 2015 to 2019. And then under mitigation and vaccines, the first chart is just showing how countries use masks to fight against COVID and that showed that to be very effective. And the chart on the bottom is just talking about the three vaccines that have been approved, which are Pfizer at 95% effectiveness, Moderna, which is 94.1% effective, and Johnson & Johnson, which is 66.3% effective. Then the chart at the top is just comparing Moderna, Pfizer, and Oxford, AstraZeneca, which is used in the UK, and how they compare and where they would be used and how they would be used and who would get them. And now I will pass it on to Nicole. Hello, my name is Nicole. I will be covering our group STEM innovation. So as a unit, we agreed that genomic epidemiology can be used to track the spread of new variants of the virus. New vaccines were developed in record-breaking times. The first two were Moderna and Pfizer. Those are our messenger RNA vaccines. They're a two-shot, two-dose series. And then just recently, we have Johnson & Johnson that had came out. It's a viral vector, and it is a one dose, so one shot, and you're done. So there is a much better understanding of infant structure, disease dynamics, and social response. There's also a better understanding of our own human impacts on the environment that itself. And just to tap on a few of those, we have our greenhouse gases. So 
public transportation use, being aware of that, taking advantage and recognizing the importance of recycling, uh, maintaining our water quality, so awareness of landscapes and natural and natural built reservoirs, uh, lessening our use of pesticides, herbicides, and harmful fertilizers, and utilizing the rainwater. And lastly, air quality, so avoid burning of harsh and damaging materials, and of course, reducing over consumptuous use of personal cars, because reducing car use will reduce the burning of fossil fuels. And now I will let Miranda take us into conclusions. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a huge public health crisis, but has also impacted the environment in both positive and negative ways. In the positive side, we have air pollution, water pollution, greenhouse gases, noise pollution have improved. But on the negative side, we have personal protective equipment and masks um, adding to the huge amount of waste we already have. But because of these of the PPE and the masks, we have slowed the spread. Um, the thing that has slowed the spread the most, though, is vaccine development, which was done in record time. And now we know um, because of the Center for Infectious Disease that about 70 percent of people need to be inoculated um, in order to have herd immunity. And vaccine development has also shown trends that less people are dying now since getting vaccinated. But we still have uncertainties that remain, such as new strains, new variants, new pandemics, and a new uptick in the virus. And we have to worry about the impact that's going to have on poor population and vulnerable populations in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Rina, do you want to introduce our next speakers? So our next speaker comes from uh, SciTech High School. They were the high school winners. They were so awesome. We let uh, their teacher Yaya uh, start the presentation. So hi, I am Miss um, uh, Yaya. I'm part of a change maker program at Springfield Public Schools. I will not talk too much because I know my team are going to present their ideas and their solutions that they already implemented and collected data about it. So Jacob, take the presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Goldman and this is our team of change makers solutions for the Vertical Garden Initiative. And here is my team, as you can see on the screen, um, Salam is my other co-presenter. We have Shaleen, Denisha, Karami, Solanji, Yolani, Jocelyn, Olivia, and Miss Yaya. And we are attacking Springfield deserts with sustainability, which is the greatest weapon that we can use. So over the, over the centuries, uh, vertical gardens have been very widely used. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And now the whole idea is making a comeback with the need to sustain our resources and provide food that's very healthy for the growing population. So I'm Salam and this is our journey. And this is how we're gonna be taking you through on how we plan to attack um, the food desert areas in the Springfield. Um, we're gonna start off with Jacob explaining the challenges. So on the left side of the map, um, there's, there's a large um, red area that's being circled. And that shows the group of the, the area of Springfield where there's very little um, money that's going into it. People are making very little income. And as is seen on the map to the right, that's also the area with a large amount of, of convenience stores that don't necessarily have the freshest foods or the healthiest foods, which can be a problem because that's what a food desert is. Our team objectives. So our team objectives were to design a system that provides accessible, highly nutritious food for the families in Springfield, a system that costs zero budget to build, a system with low maintenance and sustainable production of food every 10 days, a system that does not require a space that is portable, a system that 
upcycles plastic and materials and produces plants that contribute in lowering the carbon footprint. A system that provides a positive mental energy for people in the house, especially with the isolation during the pandemic. And finally, a system that is sustainable. So how do you attack Springfield desert areas? Well, there's five solutions that we've come up with. One, you need fast growing and high in nutrient foods. Two, you need to depend on sustainable resources such as water and sunlight. Three, you need to reuse materials, thereby reducing the carbon footprint. Four, you need it to be low in space. And five, it needs to look nice. And with that, we came up with microgreen, hydroponic, upcycled, vertical gardens. So this is our group data. We have um, two types of data, quantitative and qualitative, along with map analysis. We're going to be checking out our Padlet, which has um, all our qualitative data. It has pictures. Over here, you can see pictures of um, our stories on how we built our vertical garden systems, along with pictures of our designs and materials. So heading back to our presentation. We're gonna move on to our results. Uh, this is our quantity data. So we conducted a survey on calculating um, the amount of non-food plastic that is being used by our group families. And we got 297 kilograms wasted a year. You can see that in the graph below. Um, through our 21 inch vertical garden system, we were able to upcycle 558 grams in 10 days. And 20 kilograms in an entire year. So we took, based on our calculations, we took that number and we made a prediction for the Springfield population, divided in groups of 10, and we got 10 million kilograms of plastic that is being recycled in that year. So then we took the data that we used, that young trees absorb up to six kilograms of CO2 per year, and an acre of trees can absorb up to two and a half tons of CO2 every year. And we figured out that the Springfield um, population as it stands now consumes about 265,500 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. But then we estimated that if everybody in Springfield had our gardens, we would be able to save up to 120 um, tons of carbon every year, which is immense. And, and without using electricity or transportation, that lowers the consumption of energy like burning fossil fuels and reducing the carbon footprint of our community. And so the benefits that come in with the use of sprouts and microgreens is that they're very fast. They grow only in a few days. They have seven times the nutrition of the mature plant. They have tons of protein. Um, a mature plant has 15 grams of protein while a sprouts have over hundred grams of, pro of protein. Um, they are a cheap form of nutrition and they can be grown at home or anywhere by anybody. Uh, so our conclusion, um, after going through this journey of designing and data collection, we are more confident that different programs like Change Maker, Hydroponics, Cooler Community, and Sustainability Approaches can make a huge impact on our city and allow low-income families to easy access to fresh products, no to low cost. In addition, educating the younger generation will contribute in lowering the carbon footprint through sustainable methods. Our future vision will be sustainable vertical garden throughout the city. Over the next year, we're going to do all sorts of things to improve our designs. We're gonna um, teach younger generations to up, upcycle more materials around their parks and neighborhoods to make themselves help, healthier. We're gonna use the Springfield maps from earlier to find new desert regions, and we're gonna promote vertical gardens there so that we can help them. And we're going to use sustainable energy sources to provide energy during the winter, which will help a lot of people. So this was the end of our presentation. On the bottom right, you can see our references if you'd like to check out that out later. Um, and thank you for watching. Thank you. So to conclude, we have the Director of Science of Schools, Ron. So he's going to uh, conclude our event by 
Uh, going over the call for action. Okay, we've learned all of this. What are we going to do with this? What are the little changes that we are going to do? So Ron is going to go over it and we will dismiss after that. Please uh, pay attention. The link uh, will be posted in chat. Yes, thank you Ron. Very much. Rena and and thank you to Rena and Tim for putting on this wonderful event. I am Ron Sayman. I'm the director of science in the Springfield Schools, and I'd also like to thank our presenters, including our students from the High School of Science and Technology and um, from STCC for sharing their wonderful projects with us, and for all of our students who participated uh, in the poster competition. So we heard from Dr. Rollins that uh, human activities are leading to uh, the earth warming. But we also heard there's reason for optimism. We heard from Dr. Lerman about uh, the possibilities of pollination and how we can um, change our habits around just something as simple as lawn mowing to make a difference. Um, it's funny, she mentioned the National Wildlife Federation. We put in 26 pollinator gardens in the Springfield schools with the National Wildlife Federation support. Uh, just over the last several years. Dr. Yao talked about a cutting edge technology, the air gen system to get electricity from the air, um, really promising technology and moving forward with green energy. And of course, Dr. Kelsey talking about hope matters, that there is hope and we need to focus on solutions, not just the problem. And in a day where the, the press is really pushing the problems, we have to remember there are solutions. Uh, you know, Dr. Rollins talked about that carbon emissions in the U.S. have actually been going down over the last 10 years. So you can make a difference. And what we're hoping you will do is take our Cooler Communities Pledge. Through the Cooler Communities Pledge, which students at um, our Springfield Central High School and the High School of Science and Technology put together, you can reduce your carbon footprint. So... Um, the pledge actually provides a number of different actions that you can take. And when you um, go to the website, you'll be able to look at that actions and you'll be able to see um, what are the steps you could take. There'll be testimonials and even more information about uh, the actions in a deep dive. So doing things from saving water to reducing your power consumption, recycling, um, you can have an impact. So I'm hoping that you'll reach out to your friends and family um, and ask them to take the pledge with you um, and help reduce our carbon footprint here in Springfield. In addition, everyone who tells us their experience in the testimonial section um, uh, can win a $25, uh, will be eligible to win a $25 Visa gift card. So for our students, uh, please go into that testimonial section and then 10 of you will win a gift card uh, for, for taking part in the pledge. You know, Rena also wanted me to mention with Earth Day next week, um, there will be a tree planting campaign with Regreen Springfield. Um, and I will send out more information about that uh, to my students and teachers. And Rena will do the same to her folks at STCC. So with that, I would uh, like to thank everyone for being here. I really appreciate your participation. And I hope you feel a sense of optimism and hope that we can make a difference. And also, I hope you heard some ideas that make you think about, hmm, maybe that's something I'd like to learn more about, or maybe that's an area that, that I'd like to pursue in my studies. So uh, thanks again to all of you for being here. We really appreciate it. What a wonderful event. And thank you so much to Rena, Tim, STCC, UMass, all our presenters uh, for such a wonderful uh, morning.